Calshot, a mile-long shingle bank that was once a hive of aviation activity. For nearly 50 years, it was a strategic base for military flying boats, high-speed aircraft, and top-secret seaplanes. In 2010, the crew of the Calshot lifeboat snagged their mooring lines on a heavy object. When it was brought to the surface, they realized it was a large aircraft propeller. The unusual find made headlines and sparked interest from all over the country. But where had it come from? And was the rest of the aircraft still there? This sheltered expanse of water on the Solent was an ideal location for flying boats. In 1913, the Royal Navy established a small base here. By the 1930s, the Royal Air Force had taken over and it had grown to accommodate several squadrons of large flying boats and thousands of men. Today, all the aircraft have gone but clear evidence of Cowshot's history is very visible with these large aircraft hangars. And beneath the water, there are other clues. We did, we're trying to find something local to dive, and we were looking at the books, and, and the book says there's a Sunderland flying boat down at Cowshot. So we did some research, we went down there, spoke to the RNLI, um, and they confirmed there was something down there that they see on their sonar. And then coincidentally, about a month after, one of their anchor chains caught on something, and they pulled it up, and there's a big propeller on the end. We came back from uh, an exercise one evening uh, and the mooring buoy that the lifeboat sits on was lower than normal. So I asked for a, uh, an underwater inspection of the chains, so we moved the lifeboat off and we hauled the chains to the surface, uh, all of the anchors and chains and the mooring gear to the surface, and lo and behold the propeller was actually wound up in the chains and we managed to pull it out of the engine. Now housed at the Solent Sky Museum, this is the propeller that was dragged up. On first inspection, it was obvious that apart from saltwater corrosion, it was in good condition, which suggests the aircraft sank at her moorings. If the aircraft had crashed, the blades would probably have been bent and damaged. Intriguingly though, when it was recovered, an error on the aircraft's identity was noticed. On the maritime charts, the wreck was recorded as PP118, a Mark V Sunderland. This propeller, however, is a different shape to those fitted to a Mark V Sunderland. Our objective is to try and identify this flying boat. Now we know three potential aircraft that could be. The first is PP118. This sank in 1950 and this is the aircraft it was first thought to be. There's another possibility, it might be ML883, which sank in 1944. And there's another aircraft, a civilian flying boat that sank in 1953. Now John and his team have already managed to do a preliminary dive on the wreck, but they couldn't come back with any markings, so nobody as of yet has formally identified this aircraft. We also want to know what happened to the wreck since it's been submerged. Before the team dived on the wreck, they were aware that the tail section was missing, but believed the rest of the aircraft was complete. And as always, We'll be using social media to see if we can unearth memories, information or photographs of those involved at Cowshot. Rugged and reliable, the Short Sunderland was the backbone of RAF Coastal Command during the Second World War. In 1937, to meet an Air Ministry specification for a long-range maritime patrol aircraft, Short submitted a design based upon their already successful C-Class flying boat. Gun turrets were added to the nose and tail, and depth charges were housed within the fuselage. The long range of 1,700 miles, the large payload and strong airframe enabled the Sunderland to perform many different roles, including convoy protection, air-sea rescue, and general transport. Between 1939 and 1945, 60 U-boats were either damaged or destroyed by Sunderlands, a huge contribution to protecting Allied shipping. 
In total, 708 were built, with many being converted from military to civilian roles after the war. To give a better idea of what the wreck is like, John has come to the Solent Sky Museum to meet me and the team. John, what was the first dive like when you went down? What did you find? We dropped down, we were expecting sort of 20 metres. We knew there was a, a five metre bump on the seabed and luckily we landed directly on top of it. Um, so we landed on the top of the aircraft. We realised it was upturned at that point. Um, we just came off the side of the hull, dropped down the side of it, passed a few windows on the way down. So the windows were, were like on the model here, they were round windows, they were, round were they? Windows, yeah. Well, that certainly indicates that this must have been a, a, a military flying boat. This was a Sunderland and not one of the, the later civil conversions. And we know from the engines um, that it's unlikely to be PP118 because the, the propeller shape is different. Yep. Um, so everything is pointing towards it being ML883. At an early stage, we've got quite a strong lead on this. Yes. But... This is how you, you found the wreck at the bottom, and I've got to say, um, something's missing off the front. <laughs> we haven't found that yet. So that took you by surprise when you got down there? Yeah, and, yeah. And I would say, as you find an airplane, you expect to be able to go down and find the nose. That's the main identifiable part. Well, somebody must know what happened to this aircraft, and Sarah, we're going to go out onto social media and yes. we're going to ask some questions. Uh, there's been quite a bit of paper research on this, but we're going to see if we can find... I think so. I think put the question out there. See if anybody's got any stories or anything. You never know, we, we might come across it. Just put mm. it out there. Mm. And we can ask, has anybody got yeah. one of these in their bag? It would make a good shed, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's a playhouse. <laughs> yeah, oh, fantastic for that. That's great. Now, we're in the right place to talk about flying boats because we've got one enormous one right behind us. And John, I know you're itching to get all over that. It's the right way up. I want to go, to, I want to go have a good <laughs> look at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. The flying boat on display at Solent Sky was built as a Mark III Sunderland in 1943, but it was converted in 1947 to a civilian Sandringham. During the 1970s, she operated from Rose Bay in Australia, flying out to Lord Howe Island. Although she's equipped with comfortable seating in a kitchen, she's still very similar to the Sunderland at Cowshot. Doing that in dive gear. <laughs> oh wow. Oh, let's have a look. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh wow. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Goodness me. <laughs> Not easy. Tight squeeze again. Yeah. God, you get to you get to really appreciate the scale up here, don't you? Yeah, I was say you don't get to see all this underwater. You can you can't even see as far as the first engine. So. And one of the wings is in the mud, isn't it? Yeah, one of them dips down underneath the, the mud. We've been down that one as far as the second engine. Right. The other wing comes up out the mud. Right. So we've got the first engine, and then the wing seems to be broken after that. And we know the tailplane's missing as well. Yeah, yeah, the original 1970s report says it's an intact airplane, apart from the tail. And there's three windows here, just beyond the last window. It looks as like someone's put a chain around it. It's very ragged, they've pulled the tail off. And interestingly, you discovered that the front of the aircraft is missing as well. Yeah, something we weren't expecting is just on a line from the back of the cockpit window right across, the nose has been removed. Um, not ragged like the back, it's actually been cut across with an angle grinder or a saw. It's very clean. So why would you want to remove the front of a flying boat? That's a big question. We've got no idea on that one. During the Second World War, Cowshot was used as a base for top secret flying boats. Captured German aircraft were used to fly secret agents in and out of occupied Europe. Was there a connection? Did the front section of our flying boat have anything top secret on board that had to be retrieved quickly after it sank? It's unlikely, as it would have been far easier to salvage the whole aircraft rather than cutting the nose off underwater. Another theory is that the aircraft was used to practice underwater cutting techniques. Could it have been a specialist team of military divers using it for a salvage and rescue exercise? Although we now have a strong suspicion that the wreck at Cowshot is ML883, 
Sarah and Chris are looking into one of the other flying boat stories that John came across. Sunderland PP118 was assigned to a conversion unit operating at Cowshot. On the 3rd of February 1950, she flooded with water and sank. Several days later, while two men were on board, a box of flares ignited and a fire broke out. Within seconds, the whole airframe was ablaze and the two men were stranded on the burning aircraft. At that time, Peter Anderson, an RAF coxswain, was passing in a small boat. He quickly turned around and brought the boat through the intense heat just close enough for the two men to jump aboard. A fire on a flying boat must have been terrifying. Sarah and Chris want to know more about this story and so while John and I are exploring up top, they've met with former fire officer Alan House down in the tailplane of the Sandringham. So as you can see, now you're in here, how very, very uh, light and open the construction is. And these panels here, uh, the external skin is very, very thin. The big problem is the fact that this, as this melts, it allows oxygen in more. So it's feeding, uh, it, feeding the fire yeah, effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So that they would have had to make a, a very rapid uh, exit to one of the uh, so available doors. Out the door then. Yeah, and then they'd be faced on the outside, they've still got the fire effectively because yeah. it's, it's burning on top of the water. All of the, all of the fuel, so when, when you're jumping out of the aircraft, you're actually leaping into the flames. When, when you, You'd when have you no that. choice. Uh, the boat that came in to, to rescue them, as that came through the burning fuel, it would have parted it, uh, which gave them that window of opportunity yeah, to... escape route you know, to be able to get yeah, away safely. Indeed, yeah. Goodness They're very lucky. It was an exceptional act of bravery, for which Peter Anderson was awarded the George Medal. Sarah, any joy? Have we found our tailplane? Yes, well, we've actually had three leads. Um, a Colin Van Geffen has come to us via Facebook, um, and he says that the tail section was pulled off by a team who were tasked with checking and setting moorings in the area. Um, they attached a chain to the rear fuselage in the hope of dragging the whole section into shallow water, um, but the tail section broke away, um, and then the diver had to vacate the scene rather rapidly after he had spotted the head of a large conger eel inside the fuselage. Oh my God, that sounds quite scary. <laughs> Would have been a is, yeah. Yeah, is it, yeah. Do you think it's still down there? There's quite a few fishermen go around there still looking for stuff, so yeah, probably. <laughs> and we've also got uh, Ross McFarlane, who says that uh, many years ago I worked with ML814, which was another Sunderland flying boat at Calshot. Uh, he says a team of divers went down to investigate the sunken aircraft and they brought up a very corroded wing leading edge. And uh, there's also Peter Sedgley who's come from. Oh, right, you, well. you've been in touch with Peter. Yeah, I've been having a bit of a chat with him. Um, he remembers seeing the probably the tail section of his flying boat with a gun turret on it on Town Quay. That's really interesting. That so that might be quite a, quite a hot lead. Peter states he saw the wreckage on the seaward side of the Town Quay in Southampton. Amongst the debris was a rear gun turret and he was 95% certain it was from a Sunderland flying boat. If this was the tail section of the Cowshot Sunderland and if it was salvaged by the Harbour Authority, it's plausible that the wreckage may have been brought upstream to Southampton by boat. We've had a huge amount of replies to our social media posts and three very strong stories. However, nobody has come forward about the front of the wreck. We now believe our best chance of identifying the aircraft is to try and find some markings on the engines. If the team can reach one of the four engines on their next dive and come back with a number, we may be able to formally identify the wreck. The dive is planned for three days time and I've come along to meet the team who will be diving on the wreck at the headquarters of Cowshot Sub Aqua Club, otherwise known as the pub. So we're going to get tides right? We've got to get permissions, permissions to the um, <coughs> proximity to the shipping channel and we need to get permission from the Harbour Authority because it's within, within the bounds of the Harbour Authority. So are there many dangers involved in this particular wreck? It's quite a popular spot for fishing so there's a lot of fishing line on it because there is quite a lot of fish life there. Um, it's in, right on the edge of the shipping channel as well so oh God, yeah. you, you definitely don't want to drift in that, into that with a red jet coming past you at 30 plus knots. Oh nice, yes. Again because of the current there we don't have a long time to be down there. Um, if we 
sort of take 45 minutes and the crowd will turn around and it gets really awkward down there. So what was it like for your dive then when, when you went down and saw her the first time? Um, I think the first thing that struck me was green. green. It was very green. Uh, the other thing that struck me was the size of the lobster sitting in the... Uh, yeah. Oh God, the yeah. biggest, it's got claws like... <laughs> is it a monster lobster yeah. in there as well? Oh, yeah. great, great yeah. <laughs> as well as avoiding the monster lobster, the dive has other complications. The team have already dived on a slack tide when the water is at its stillest, but has found the mud and debris pulled down from the rivers further upstream reduce the visibility. This time they're aiming for a high spring tide with the hope that clean water from the Atlantic will be coming in. The divers also have to be careful of the strong currents that circulate around the bay. A disorientated diver could all too easily be pulled into the busy shipping lanes of the Solent. It's the day of the dive, and although it's nice and sunny up top, John has serious concerns about the visibility underwater. This is a high water spring. Yes. We were hoping the nice clean North Atlantic water is going to be coming in, it's yeah. going to be great. But popping down there yesterday and checking, it was about six inches for it. Wow. So we have a look. We're about 400 metres away from the edge of Cowshot Spit and beneath me, about 20 metres down, is the wreck of the flying boat which John and his team are shortly going to be diving on. But you can see how difficult it is for, for John and his team with the amount of vessels which use this piece of water and this enormous great commercial vessel uh, which dwarfs this, this small sailing boat as it's going by and this really makes it a difficult piece of water to try and, try and work on. After checking the charts and sonar, the team drops down a shot. Three, two, one, drop. This line prevents the divers from drifting away from the wreck on their way down. With the tides changing, John is eager to get into the water, but not before all the safety checks are carried out. When everything is in place, John and Graham can start the dive down into the murky waters of the Solent. Ralph raises a dive flag as a warning to other vessels that divers are below. For the team on the surface, there is little to do but wait. Eventually, through the gloomy water, the flying boat appears. John finds one of the round windows, an important clue in identifying this aircraft. As the team descend further, it quickly becomes obvious that the previous day's rain and the rise and fall of the tide have stirred up the mud and silt. The visibility is just too poor. As a result, John aborts the dive. the flying boat gets to keep her secrets once again. The visibility issues have forced the team to rethink the dive plan. A few weeks later, I meet with John to discuss the next stage. Hi Andy, how are we doing? Not too bad, good to see you again. News? Not good, I'm afraid. Um, the last couple of weeks of storms have just kicked it up. Terrible. Yeah. Um, and we've also just heard they're about to start dredging again. Ah, that's going to so affect what we're doing. Probably not going to dive it again this year. So. Unfortunately, time has beaten us this year. 
The dredging work will make conditions very difficult for diving. It's a reminder of how busy this stretch of water is. We set out to find what aircraft had been discovered at Calshot. And with all the evidence in front of us, it looks as though it is ML883, a Sunderland from 423 Squadron Royal Canadian Air Force that sank in a storm in 1944. But until John can come up with those engine numbers, we can't be 100% certain. We now know that the tailplane was removed by the Harbour Authority because it was sticking into the shipping lane, but we're still unclear as to why the front of the aircraft was cut off. Did it have something top secret on board? Was it souvenir hunters? Or was it simply in the way? As with all our stories, we want to keep this going. So do you have any theories, any information, or maybe some photographs? If so, we'd love to hear from you. Follow us on social media, and maybe you can solve the mystery of the lost flying boat.